terrified unless I know you're with me It's a troubled place, but there is beauty too Wherever we have and completely blocked you Daddy, don't go, don't ever leave I need you with me, I need See that we're tired by a lack of love But we keep performing to try to keep up We get so confused Cause we are so lied to Truth gets so hidden and hard to find We weren't made for this We weren't made to die Only happiness was meant to make we are all starving for a world we've never known We need you back on the throne so Daddy, don't go, don't ever leave I need you with me, I need you here Father, I know that you'll never go Father, we thank you that we have an advocate with you, Jesus Christ, the righteous, our comforter. And we thank you that we can ask for your spirit. We thank you that we can come into your presence. And we thank you for your angels. I pray that the angels will be around us as we meditate, as we think upon spiritual themes tonight, as we are living in the last days of earth's history. We pray for a Christ-like character. We know that we do not possess this in ourselves. It is only a gift of your righteousness and we take hold of it through the faith of Jesus and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For those of you that are not aware, over the weekend we had an update to our website system for both the Maranatha Media websites around the world and the Father of Love websites. And uh, now the websites are mobile phone friendly. So they, uh, my son Michael has done an excellent job, and yes, I can say that as a proud father. Uh, to make the website much more accessible to mobile devices, as well as an upgrade to the interface, which should make things a lot better for us. So thank you, Adam, for the feedback. Yeah, it was just a bit difficult before. You had to, it was difficult on a mobile device, and so we had to address that, uh, that problem. And we continue to make updates. We've got more in the pipeline. Uh, many of you in the Father of Love Facebook group saw the new cover for Cross Examined, Cross Encountered, and this has been a tremendous answer to prayer. 
uh, for the right um, for the right feel for this booklet, which we want to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Well, that's that's a big ambition, but uh, by God's grace, we uh, want to present the atonement as we believe that God has presented it t- to us. And how wonderful is the atonement! Be ye reconciled to God, because He is reconciled to us, and uh, He never was unreconciled to us. That's the point that uh, we want to focus on. Uh, I received an email this morning from uh, Pastor Rogerio Buzzi, who's from Brazil, and was greatly encouraged by the message that he sent to me. He has uh, checked the translations that Brother Nelson in Arkansas has translated into Portuguese for us. And... uh, He wrote to me this morning and said, uh, the book Identity Wars is a treasure above treasures, a once in a 50 year book that you would ever read, which was quite uh, a joy to be able to read that for him to capture the essence that the book Identity Wars is the foundational cornerstone of this entire message, the introduction into the relational kingdom and a way of looking at things relationally rather than power based and so I'm very, very grateful. He wrote to me saying that in Brazil, they have a Facebook page with a following of 230,000 followers and they are wanting to share the book Identity Wars with this uh, group. They're eager to share it and uh, they're wanting to do a video series based upon the book. Uh, and so we, uh, we thank God for these developments. This is... Um, This is wonderful. So pray for Pastor Ruggiero. Uh, He is uh, a man of conviction and uh, I'm just very thankful that the Lord has revealed this uh, this to him. We thank you for the... Currently we have 35 translation projects that I'm aware of into different languages uh, and I'm, uh, I'm I'm just praising my father for this, that he opens doors for us and we are... Every day, at least for myself, as I stop at the morning, the evening sacrifice, and I think about the sufferings of Jesus and how much the world could change if they could know, if they could know what our Father was really like and to know what the cross really means. And this is a burning desire in my heart that uh, the people all around us could know. And soon I know that uh, the great light will come. But... Before that light comes, there are things for us to do and I want to speak to those things tonight in terms of God's counsel to the church of the Laodiceans. Uh, And so if we go to the screen, I want to read you a few statements. Uh, Oh, we're not going to go to the screen. Sorry, folks. Just one minute. I'll get that sorted. (laughs) Just a slight delay. There we go. This is in the testimonies. You who are tempted, you who are tempted and tried and discouraged, look up. Let no weary, halting, sin oppressed soul become faint hearted. Easy to say. You felt sin oppressed, faint hearted, like it's too hard. She says, let no weary, halting, sin oppressed soul become faint hearted and lose hope. The promises of God come sounding down along the lines to us, assuring us that we may reach heaven if we will abide in Christ. Look up. Oh, it's easy to abide in Christ when you feel like abiding in Christ. But when you don't feel like abiding in Christ because you feel like a terrible, horrible sinner, that's when we need to abide in Christ and look upon him. Look up. It is fatal to look down. What does it say? It's fatal to look down. Looking down, the, the earth reels and sways beneath you and nothing is sure. A divine hand is reaching towards you. 
The hand of the infinite is stretched over the battlements of heaven to grasp your hand in its embrace. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Over the battlements of heaven. The mighty helper is nigh to help the most erring, the most sinful, the most despairing. And the quote continues. This is Bible Echo, December 1, 1892. In the height of the 1888 message. Look up by faith and the light of the glory of God will shine upon you. Do not be discouraged because you see that your character is defective. And we'll look at some more quotes about when we see that our character is defective. There's a whole range of mechanisms that human nature has to protect itself from feeling defective. Retail therapy being one of them, chocolate being another one, all manner of things that we might do to ease our feelings of discouragement. Hmm? Motorbikes, Motorbikes <laughs> says Liam. <laughs> Motorbikes, yes, or any range of distractions to get our mind off the fact that we really feel like we're not very good. Now notice what it says, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. That's pretty rough, isn't it? The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in distinct contrast with the perfect, with his perfect character. And this is... This is the, we'll just come back. This is the position that we are in as we are beholding. If we are beholding this beautiful Jesus that is willing to suffer uh, and to put up with nonsense and to be patient and merciful and gracious and loving to the extent that he is, if he is like this, what does that make us look like? The closer you come to Christ, the more sinful you appear in your own eyes. So we go back to the screen. Be not discouraged. This is an evidence that Satan's delusions are losing their power. That the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you because when the Spirit of God comes, He convicts you of sin. That's the first thing that He does. And that your indifference and ignorance are passing away. So when you are confronted with your sinfulness, do you want to go back into your ignorance and to your folly? Do you want to go just distract yourself so you don't have to think about the fact that you are failing and you keep doing the same things and repeating the same faults of character? Or do you go on your knees and ask God to change you and to believe that he will change you? And the challenges that come that when you pray and you ask God And then things go along for a while and then you do the same thing again. And then you're tempted to think, well, what's going to happen now? I'm not going to change. God's not hearing my prayer. I'm not changing. This is the humiliation process. This is the humbling of the human heart that is so mightily proud. Great controversy says those who experience the sanctification of the Bible will manifest a spirit of humility. Like Moses, they have a view of the awful majesty of holiness. We might say awesome majesty. Awful is full of awe. We've kind of lost that meaning today. And they see their own unworthiness in contrast with the purity and exalted perfection of the infinite one. This is the experience of sanctification, the realization that there is nothing good in us. As Isaiah said, woe is me, I am undone. But what will be our testimony? These are the, these are the things that we are thinking upon. We, we studied in Passover and in weeks previous we've talked about the need for repentance and corporate repentance. Not only repentance for ourselves, but repentance on behalf of humanity. Do you remember looking at those quotes? 
when Jesus took the necessary steps in repentance, conversion and faith in behalf of the human race. And as Paul says in Corinthians, God has committed unto us the work of reconciliation. Who is going to stand in the gap? God looked for a man to stand in the gap. Who will he find to intercede and plead and to repent on behalf? Who will repent on behalf of Seventh-day Adventists? Well, certainly not those that are attacking the leadership of the Adventist Church. They're not in a position to repent on behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist Church if they are attacking the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is not possible. A little bit further, Great Controversy 471. There can be no self-exaltation, no boastful claim to freedom from sin on the part of those who walk in the shadow of Calvary's cross. They feel that it was their sin which caused the agony that broke the heart of the Son of God. Now notice that. It doesn't say they understand. What does it say? Feel. They feel that it was their sin which caused the agony that broke the heart of the Son of God. Have we come to that point? That we can feel it. We feel that it is our sin that has broke the heart of the Son of God. The only way you can allow yourself to believe these things is to know that God is gracious and merciful and long-suffering. To know that He is loving and gracious towards you. If you are not confident of these things and you feel that it is your sin that is doing these things, I've tried to imagine. I'm I'm trying to place myself in the position where my natural nature would rise up and want to kill the Son of God. It's just, I can't can't process it. My, My... Flesh doesn't want to accept this. I don't want to accept that I could have this capacity. Oh, I can, I can express it. I can say, yes, I, I, I comprehend, I understand that I have this capacity to be at enmity with God and His Son and have the capacity to want to do them harm. But in your heart, to feel it, to feel in your nature, there are things that are... In our characters that we do not see. We spend a lot of time trying to hide what we are from others with our spiritual forms of deodorant. To hide who we are. I was reminded of this yesterday where I had a situation where a particular company tried to take advantage of me and my family. And they tried to manipulate the situation in regard to my son. And that did not make me very happy at all. And I thought that I had dealt with that situation until, praise be to God, we had a situation happen at home where uh, I got exposed to some uh, chemicals that were not familiar to my body. And that woke me up the next morning feeling just a little bit out of sorts. And so when my wife mentioned to me about this particular company, out it came. That company is evil. Oh still had a spirit of unforgiveness in my heart. I didn't realize it was there. I thought I dealt with it, thought that I'd put it away. I said, okay, Lord, yep, I, I, I forgive them for what they've done. Still there. Didn't even know it was still there until that situation came up. And uh, poor old Danny had to be subjected to my frustrations and my wife. But thanks be to God that it came out, that it was revealed. So later that night, I was saying, Lord, you know, I, I really need to forgive these people. They're just trying to do their job. It wasn't nice what they did. I'm not real happy about it, but I, I, I forgive them by your grace and by your strength. These are the things that as we come closer to the end, things that are unknown to us, If they are unknown to us now, they will become known to us in the most embarrassing situations in front of many people, like what happened to Peter when he denied his Lord. What was inside of him came out. 
It was unknown to him. Though all men will forsake you, yet will not I forsake you. He fully believed it and he was fully committed to that. And he was not aware of what was inside of him that would cause him to deny his Lord at a moment when his Lord really needed him. David says, cleanse thou me from secret faults. I say, Lord, cleanse thou me from the faults I already know about. There are plenty of those. But cleanse thou me also from secret faults, from elements within my character. Which means if we ask that prayer, then we're asking for situations where we're going to feel embarrassed. <laughs> or God could just show us in our private r- <laughs> prayer and we can confess it so that when we come into those situations where difficulty arises, we have the Spirit of God. Because we've already recognized and in tears of repentance confessed that which we see God has revealed to us in our characters. This would be a much better way to repent. But as it turns out, for most of us, it goes a different way. So we come back to the screen. Those uh, who live the nearest to Jesus discern most clearly the frailty and sinfulness of humanity and their only hope is in the merit of a crucified and risen saviour if we come back to the screen yes down the bottom those who live nearest to jesus discern most clearly the frailty and sinfulness of humanity and their only hope is in the merit of a crucified and risen saviour. So that's the path that we are on. Thank you, Sharon. Glad you're with us. And uh, maybe tonight is just for my benefit. All the stuff ups so that I just completely say, we're just going to keep going and the Lord's going to get us through and we're not going to worry. And uh, just trust God to take care of us. So this quote really challenged me. I first saw this quote uh, in, the, in the Sermon 14 uh, by A.T. Jones in 1893. And when I read this, I thought, whoa, this is from Five Testimonies 48. Are you in Christ? Not if you do not acknowledge yourselves erring, helpless, condemned sinners. Condemned. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? A lot we could say about that. But are you in Christ? To be in Christ is to acknowledge yourself as erring. To be in Christ is to acknowledge yourself as helpless. To be in Christ is to acknowledge yourself as condemned. By who? By your own justice system. According to... The reason that we must acknowledge ourselves condemned is that as long as we continue to condemn others, we are condemned. (laughs) Because we do the same things, as it says in Romans chapter 2. So, uh, these are all things that tell us that, that we need to... Um, just completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> It'll come back. All right, Revelation three seventeen. When this is the focal point, the message to uh, to Laodicea. Because thou sayest that I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind. And naked. This is the situation. If we go back to the previous quote, are you in Christ? Not if you do not acknowledge yourself erring, helpless, condemned sinners. This is the problem with Laodicea. They don't recognize that they are fully erring, helpless, and condemned sinners, the church of Laodicea. We are the church that are marching to Zion. We are going forward. We are doing great things. We're doing great exploits for God. And this is a challenge that each of us face, even in the message that we are proclaiming. We could take 
uh, solace and comfort in the fact that this message is starting to grow. What are we going to do, brethren, when we are reaching 10 million, 20 million, 100 million people, 300 million people, a billion people? What are we going to do when this message reaches to that level? Are we going to glory in those things or are we going to glory in Christ alone? This is the test. And so Laodicea. Now, there are ways of dealing with this message that with the, many within the Adventist church have been able to deal with this. Because if you have to acknowledge that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked, the natural human heart doesn't want to acknowledge this. And one of the big messages that has been brought into Adventism and is particularly brought by those in self-supporting ministry is that we are not Laodicea, we are Philadelphia. Have you ever heard that teaching? We're not Laodicea, we are Philadelphia. What, what, what does it say? Are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? Not if you do not acknowledge yourselves erring, helpless, condemned sinners. The Church of Philadelphia has no rebuke. No rebuke given to this church. But for the last church, are you in Christ? Well, if you say you're a Philadelphia and that you have no problems and you are sailing along and fine, you're not in Christ. You're not in Christ. Not in the, in the revelation. I can hear I can hear audio somewhere. Is that no? All right. I like this. We come back to the screen. I'm commissioned now to say to our brethren, humble yourselves and confess your sins. Else God will humble you. See, that's what we're talking about before. If we humble ourselves in prayer, then, then we can confess and see ourselves and be humble and be like John. But if we don't, then God will allow circumstances to play out that he will humble us. And we will either have a Peter response or a Judas response. That's the, the, two, the two options. Now, the message to the Laodicean church comes home to those who do not apply it to themselves. So you say, I am of Philadelphia. Then you prove that you are Laodicean. Not only in the Laodicean church, but in the Laodicean state. If you say you are a Philadelphia, then you are in the Laodicean state because you're saying I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and do not know that you're rich, wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. So this is, this is quite a challenge for God's people. To have to continue to confess these things and to think about these things, to think about the sufferings of Christ and how do we maintain a joyful disposition in the midst of all this? The assurance that God will perfect that which concerns us. The faith of Jesus that hangs on in spite of all we see within ourselves, as we read in the beginning, not to be discouraged. When you see your failing uh, steps, when you see the wrong things that come out of your mouth, when the frustrations that build up inside of you that no one else can see and you can feel it, you can see it, you can understand it and you're tempted to think, oh, I'm not going to make it. It's just, I can't get there. But our confidence is not in ourselves. Our confidence is in Christ, that his grace is sufficient and that everything can change. I was listening to Corporate Repentance the book Corporate Repentance today and Robert Whelan was talking about hope for Laodicea. And we want to come to the remedy for Laodicea. What is the remedy for Laodicea? I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What is the gold? Faith. That your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth. Faith. Faith. Whose faith? Christ's faith. The, the faith. The faith of Jesus. I counsel you to buy of me faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of faith. 
And if you get to know him and you're in contact with him, you will purchase this faith. So, sorry, Danny. <laughs> On to the next one. That thou mayest be rich and white raiment. What is the white raiment? What? It's his righteousness. The white raiment is the righteousness of the saints. It says that in Revelation 17 as well. Faith. The faith of Jesus that produces righteousness. The faith of Jesus. Righteousness by the faith of Jesus. We need to buy. And the faith that is necessary, the faith that is the goal, what is it? I counsel to be to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What can be more trying than when you fail and you fail and you fail and you see yourself black and sinful and erring and weak that your faith does not let go? The faith that you possess, the faith of Jesus that is in your hand, does not yield. Everything is telling you it's hopeless. Everything is telling you that you are not going to make it. But the faith of Jesus says, into thy hands I commit my spirit. When he hung upon that cross and it seemed utterly impossible for him to ever be raised again from the dead, and that the weight of our sins were crushing out his life, and he felt utterly cut off from God, the faith of Jesus said, Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Regardless of what I feel, regardless of what seems certain death for me, I will overcome in the name of Christ. This is the faith, this is the gold tried in the fire that then produces a righteousness, a white raiment. And what does it say? That thy nakedness do not appear. What is our nakedness? Our nakedness is when our sins that they come out of us. It shows that we are naked. We're not covered with Christ's righteousness. Our spirit is not subdued by Christ. And our nakedness manifests when we utter things and we say things in annoyance, in frustration, in anger, in indulgence, in self-righteousness and self-pity and judgment and condemnation of others. This is our nakedness. Isn't it? And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. What is the eye salve? Oh, that I had eyes to see me as others see me. Spirit. <laughs> the Spirit. The Spirit of God is what gives you discernment to be able to see yourself and the others being God and His Son. So, faith, righteousness, Spirit. These are the three things that are promised to us in a most challenging uh, experience. I would like to uh, take you to a statement in early writings. Uh, Hopefully I can remember... No, I'll just look for it. Um, just bear with me. So, a statement regarding the straight testimony. This is what it says, early writings. I was a couple of pages out. Early writings 270. Uh, point one. As the praying ones continued, I haven't got this uh, on the screen, sorry. As the praying ones continued, uh, their earnest cries, at times a ray of light from Jesus came to encourage their hearts and light up their countenances. Some I saw did not participate in the work of agonizing and pleading. That sounds like hard work, doesn't it? Oh, do we really have to do this? Really? Some did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed indifferent 
and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them and it shut them in like a thick cloud. Many times when we feel overcome by temptation, we are offended at the fact that we have failed and so we wallow in our sinfulness and we become indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left these and went to the aid of the earnest praying ones. I saw angels of God hastening to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their power to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But the angels left those who made no effort to help themselves and I lost sight of them. Early writings 270.1 This is in relationship to the shaking. I asked the meaning of the shaking. I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. If you don't consider yourself part of Laodicea, you will not receive the straight testimony to Laodicea. If you don't receive the straight testimony to Laodicea, you will not receive the victory that is required to receive the outpouring, as we will see uh, outpouring of the latter rain. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear the straight testimony. They will rise up against it and this will cause a shaking amongst God's people. I saw that the testimony of the true witness had not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. That was a hundred years ago, plus. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance. All who truly receive it will, will obey it and be purified. Said the angel, list ye. Soon I heard a voice like many musical instruments, all sounding in perfect strains, musical instruments, uh, sorry, sweet and harmonious. It surpassed any music I'd ever heard, seeming to be full of mercy, compassion and elevating holy joy. It thrilled through my whole being, said the angel, look ye. My attention was then turned to a company I had seen who were mightily shaken. I was shown those whom I had seen before, some weeping and praying in agony of spirit. The company of guardian angels around them had been doubled and they were clothed with an armor from their head to their feet. They moved in exact order like a company of soldiers. Their countenance expressed the severe conflict which they had endured, the agonizing struggle which they had passed through. Yet their features marked with severe internal anguish now shone with the light and the glory of heaven. They had obtained the victory and it called forth from them the deepest gratitude and holy sacred joy. This is the path to heaven. There is no other way except this path. The number of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. The careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly plead and agonize for it, did not obtain it. And they were left in darkness. And their places were immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks. Evil angels still pressed around them, but could have no power over them. If we do not feel our great need and we are busy and filled with the things of this life, ultimately the angels of God will leave us when it comes to the time of the shaking. If we make no burden, no effort, no effort 
But the effort comes when we see what Jesus is like and our desire to have his character and the desire to change that we will begin to plead. And as I think every day about the sufferings of Christ and then I think how easily I can forget that I can go one day, two days, three days, four days, a week without thinking about the intense agony that Christ has suffered for the maybe 800,000 aborted children within one week and the agony that this caused Christ, the 21,000 people that have committed suicide and the agony that Christ continues to endure. It's easy to just go back to sleep and think about the fact that you know, I need to comfort myself because life is hard and people treat me harshly and I need to comfort myself. But what of Christ? What of his suffering? What of his agony? When will it end? And we say this again, and I want to say this as gently as I can say it. If we preach that there is a fixed time, according to some prophecy, in which the end will come, then there's no element bearing upon us to do anything to hasten the coming of Christ because it's all predetermined. It's already been worked out. But if we are waiting for the Mary Magdalene experience for God's people, if God is, we think we're waiting for God, but God is waiting for us. We just expect, we all think, as we look, look with longing eyes towards America and the papacy and as things get worse and worse and worse, we think the end is coming. What about the people that lived through the Second World War? Didn't they think that was the end of the world? We've come, we've come a long way from there and we're still here. Could happen again. Could but that God's people will understand that the sufferings of Christ must end and that we come to a realisation of a repentance. And we have talked about this and I find as I'm listening to corporate repentance again, I thought, you know, you haven't thought about this for about four days, Adrian. You, you've let your mind be filled with other things. There's work to be done. I have plenty of work that I'm doing, obviously, but the work, and I said this in Passover, to spend most of our time in prayer and uh, seeking the Lord. Well, that's not what I've done. I've spent some time in prayer. It'd be good to pray here in the morning and evening sacrifice. But as I read these statements, and I know this relates to the shaking, and I know this relates to the commencement of the time of trouble, but we are in a bit of trouble at the moment. I won't say it's the time of trouble, but we are in a bit of trouble at the moment. But our confidence, as we continue to walk down this line, we don't want to muster up some human righteousness to respond to what God is saying. No, we can't. There's nothing that we can do within ourselves. Anything that you would do in response to... This message is only because Christ is drawing you and only that he is calling you. And so we're coming up to Pentecost on May 31. The time that the disciples spent in the 10 days before from day 40 until May 31. Sorry, <laughs> until 10 days later. I know what it wasn't May 31 in AD 31, but uh, I don't think it was. But the thought that comes to me is that we need to mark a special time. Not driven by our works, not driven by our own desires to prove that we can do anything because we can't do anything in ourselves, but that we would respond to God. That we cannot produce, we cannot produce an agonizing experience um, that is anyway genuine in ourselves. Only God can do this for us. And to come to terms with the fact that we feel 
that our sins have caused the death of the Son of God, that we feel this. As I pray about this in myself, as I think about this, I think, how will this happen? And how will God's people as a group come into this position? And how would the Seventh-day Adventist Church respond to this message? In my flesh, I cannot see this happening. I, have no, I, I, I can't see how this could happen. For things to turn around. But I say to the Lord, well, I believe that I believe you're going to do this somehow, some way. Some, you're going to change something. And that we want it to change. That we get to the point where we say, Lord, we can't bear another day living the way that we are living. Please help us. Please give to us the spirit of prayer. And I pray leading up to this Pentecost that the filling that we will receive on May 31 will be in accordance with our desire to have it. And if we are rich and increased with goods because of the great message that we have been preaching, we're not going to receive much spirit. Because we've already got lots, we've got lots of books. We've got a great message about a wonderful God and loving and merciful. We really, you know, we really are a lot better than a lot of other people. Maybe. It's tempting to think this way. Tempting to think in that line of thought. I thank you, God, I'm not like other people. Adventists. I worship the true God. I keep his appointments. I believe in his character. I believe yeah, it's very tempting. But if we are truly looking at these things and believing in what they mean, it should be saying, Lord, I'm not like this at all. I'm completely opposite to this and I need to change. So tonight is a call to leading up to Pentecost. As, what are we today? It's 13th. We've got 17, 18 days. 17, 18 days to prepare. So I just pray that God will give to us his spirit over the next two and a half weeks and that we will have a deeper experience in the things of God. Not to manufacture anything, but to believe and trust that God will help us because we cannot make it happen in ourselves. He counsels us to buy of him gold tried in the fire. White raiment that we may be clothed and to the shame of our nakedness that will stop, we'll stop getting offended when people don't treat us the way we want. <laughs> we'll, stop, uh, we'll stop thinking about what we're going to stick in our stomachs more than helping other people and all, all those types of things that will stop being offended about a whole range of things that offend us at the present time and we'll have eyes salve to see our true condition. That is the message that I wanted to share. I don't... Uh, oh, that's the... And what, I guess this is a good place. We come back up onto the screen. The good news is that we don't have to manufacture this process because it says, after Christ had taken the necessary steps in repentance, conversion and faith in behalf of the human race, he went to John to be baptised. We can ask for his repentance because our repentance is pretty pathetic. We can ask for his conversion experience because uh, ours is pretty weak. And faith, his faith, uh, in behalf of the human race, I pray that God will help us in these things and we will ponder these things. I'm finding great solace in the morning and evening sacrifice and just thinking, you know, Jesus is really suffering right now. He's really in agony. And just to watch with him and to spend time with him and to, to pray that God will give us his spirit. On the other hand, as we pray here, the morning and evening sacrifice, we're praying for all of you as much as we can, praying for God to bless you and to help you and to strengthen you to, to face the challenges. I was talking to one dear brother a couple of hours ago and he talked about the tremendous struggle that he went through. Now Satan was trying to destroy his confidence and his faith and how that Jesus has helped him. These are the challenges that, that are before us. So let us not be alarmed if things get difficult and things get hard, but let us 
be of that company that pray, that take earnestly hold of the arms of Christ. Maybe we should sing a hymn together, Sweet Hour of Prayer. That sounds like a good hymn, don't you think? Sweet Hour of Prayer. Four seven eight. Four seven eight. Number four hundred and seventy eight. Praise the Lord, I think we're still on. I think yeah. everyone's still with us. to see and to pray for your spirit and to pray that we would think about how much our beloved Saviour is suffering and that our thoughts of his suffering and your suffering will take over our thoughts about our own suffering and our own inconveniences and our own struggles and that we would think about the great redemption cost that has been paid and that we would, as we come up to Pentecost, we would have a transformation. Give us the spirit of prayer, Father, 
Give us the spirit of repentance. May we have more time to spend in meditation with you in the next couple of weeks and to believe that you will bring about a change, not of works, that these things would not be done to appease you or to do something to make you notice us. None of these things will change the situation we're in, but simply that you would give us that spirit of repentance, spirit of prayer, faith, gold, white raiment, and myself. Pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray you'll bless them, give them courage, give them strength in the bat their battles against sin. And as we confess that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, that you would give to us all the things that we need to be ready for your coming. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. We'll see you on Sabbath. Thank you, everyone. Outro. He the Lord.